One of the most impactful series of films in my life and in the history of cinema has been the original Star Wars trilogy. At the time of its release, George Lucas's vision was one which no one had ever seen anything like on the big screen to that point. It was an experience, resulting in a trilogy of movies that have resonated with millions. But just like those whose lives have been touched by the films, I have my own individual moments from the trilogy that certainly stand out for various reasons. Hey everyone, this is Jan Mann, and these are my top 10 favorite moments from the original Star Wars trilogy. Seeing that opening Star Wars logo blast on screen for the first time, accompanied by that now instantly recognizable John Williams score, is certainly an attention getter. The yellow text crawl that follows also gives a unique visual context before even seeing that galaxy far, far away. What is remarkable too is how the logo and crawl simplicity is just as commanding and effective when watching today as it was when it debuted in 1977. It may not have the same surprise factor as it did then, given how familiar people are with it now, but both then and now still shows or reminds the viewer what a visual experience and adventure Star Wars is about to be. It's impressive how George Lucas took creative inspiration from a template set by the Flash Gordon serials of the 1930s and 40s and turned his own version of a logo and text crawl into something that would ultimately be as anticipated and appreciated as the live action that would follow. While each movie begins with a ship in flight after that opening crawl, none are cooler or more viscerally impressive than when that elongated Star Destroyer chases the comparatively small Rebel Cruiser, firing directly at it. Though the Rebel Cruiser is interesting looking from a visual and sound standpoint, the sheer size and magnitude of that Star Destroyer, as it is ever so slowly revealed, is all the more visually arresting. Not to mention how Lucas and crew ingeniously made it seem as though it flies directly over the audience's head via both the way it is shot and the way its sound design follows the ship. It puts the audience right in the midst of this fantastical, larger-than-life space battle. Prior to or during watching The Empire Strikes Back in 1980, no one, except for some of those who worked on the movie, knew Yoda would be revealed to be the Jedi Master who would be needed to train and ensure that Luke would become a Jedi to help defeat the Galactic Empire. While watching for the first time, most thought that Yoda was just a quirky, kind of cute creature, another in what was becoming a long list of interesting, otherworldly creatures and characters. But the way that Frank Oz is able to alter Yoda's voice, how Yoda's facial expression changes, merely stating, I cannot train him, it's amazing how convincing Yoda goes from a perception of and having quirky and childlike behavior to portraying knowing aged old wisdom within seconds. Once Luke realizes it's Yoda, and in turn the audience does as well, again, it's immediately credible. It's also incredible how this is done with a puppet and its ability to demonstrate such nuanced, telling facial expressions. I know, it's one of the most underquoted lines from the Star Wars trilogy, but is one of the most funny and fitting in terms of the relationship between Han Solo and Princess Leia. The reason it works so well is that The Empire Strikes Back does a great job at expanding and building upon the friction between Han and Leia that the first film set up. It's a palpable tension, quickly becoming a wall between them, given Leia is a leader for the greater good, albeit a feisty one who's not afraid to stand up for what she believes in, while Solo is an arrogant, self-serving smuggler who's not afraid to smooth-talk his way into getting out of trouble or what he wants. 
but in true opposites attract romance, despite their back and forth bickering with one another, each eventually discovers that their personalities share more in common than what differentiates them. By the time Han states, I know, as Leia tells him she loves him right before he's placed into Carbonite, their relationship in Han's character has been built so well that the line works perfectly. It's funny, but not in a tonally awkward way because that's what Han would say. He is that cocky guy, even though by this point, the audience does know that he loves Leia. Moss Eisley Spaceport. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. Obi-Wan's descriptor is pretty accurate. Once the cantina, filled with some creatively constructed creature slash alien criminals and smugglers, is introduced. Though today this sequence would likely be created using mostly CGI or a combination of practical and computer generated effects, the various creatures in their makeup and or masks nonetheless hold up really well. Even if some of the masks here and there look a little too inarticulate or lack dynamic expression. But it's truly the spectacle of it all that's engrossing with that unmistakable cantina music playing in the background and again in a time when something of this scale in terms of various creatures and humanoids was far from the norm. When a scene makes the viewer want to willingly scan the screen to see the various creatures lining the walls or little details the eye can catch, then the art department, makeup, and the rest of the crew are doing something very right. Once C-3PO and R2-D2 land on Tatooine, a desolate world is created. Sand as far as can be seen, with intermittent rock canyons and crevices. It's a fitting land in which both the droids could become lost in, and eventually taken in by the scavenger Jawas, just as it is a credible location for the native, less than friendly sand people and their tense attack on Luke. Most importantly, however, it is the perfect setting to further illuminate a lost farm boy who wants nothing more than to leave the vacuous landscape for a more meaningful journey and life purpose. Like with Tatooine, the ice planet of Hoth has a sense of foreboding isolation. Add to that setting an attack by Imperial walkers on the hidden rebel base, and it's pretty awe-inducing. The Star Wars trilogy in general has a great way of introducing its settings, creatures, robots, and characters in this grand and simultaneously interesting way. And the same applies to the giant four-legged Imperial AT-AT walkers as they take out the comparatively small rebel base. On one hand, they seem impractically and mechanically absurd, but on the other, the sheer size and monstrosity of them is imposing and pretty cool looking. When the rebels eventually take out a couple of them, it truly feels like a hard fought victory against what seems to be nearly impenetrable and unbeatable. Amazing too is how these machines and the rebel snow speeders were created with models and more practical optical effects that in many instances look as good as those seen in modern movies that implement more advanced technology. As if his introduction when emerging from the smoky carnage that he inflicted on the rebel cruiser and choking out a rebel leader in the process was not forceful or evil enough, Darth Vader's villainy really shines when force choking not an enemy but one of his own Imperial officers who dares to challenge him over his devotion to the Force. It's quite the understatement that Vader makes a statement when challenged. It's like the ultimate mic drop moment, imminently demonstrating that his Force abilities aren't too shabby and silencing his opposition in the process, topped off by one exceptional line of knowing condescension. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Psst. 
Speculation and mystery surrounding Jabba the Hutt had been built through both Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back. Therefore, the slow buildup in Return of the Jedi of his reveal is very effective. The way that it's done with C-3PO and R2-D2 walking up to his palace door and being taken through his lair allows the audience to observe the seedy, dark layout of the place. Leia's failed rescue of Han, resulting in her becoming Jabba's slave, donned in a suggestive, now iconic outfit, further illuminates the stronghold the vile gangster has. When the now master Jedi Luke's rescue of his friends occurs, with him battling off the Rancor and each of Jabba's palace guards, all while Leia chokes Jabba to death with the very chains he uses to bind her next to him, makes the entire sequence unfold in such a naturally captivating, fun, rousing way. Each of the monster slash creature characters also look even more real compared to the cantina sequence in the original Star Wars. Granted, this is six years later with more experience and budget, but characters like Jabba for being a big puppet look so real, so lifelike, as does the accompanying set design. It is the culmination of the story's arc. The farm boy, Luke Skywalker, without much ambition in life, becomes a Jedi like his father before him, while the father who joined the dark side is ultimately redeemed by that very son. There is a certain poeticness about it. The dueling nature within Darth Vader between the good side and the dark side, and Luke's refusal to fight his father even at the pressure and forceful hands of the evil Emperor, all because of his eternal belief in Anakin, the good side of his father, not the twisted evil more machine-like Darth Vader. The moment when the audience wonders will Vader or won't Vader save Luke, looking at the Emperor, then his child, is such a gripping, climactic moment. And when Vader picks the Emperor up and tosses him down the reactor shaft, followed by asking Luke, his son, to help him take his mask off to see him with his own eyes one final time, is a fitting emotional end to a trilogy that, as demonstrated in this sequence and throughout, is largely about the force of good prevailing over evil and the undeniable bond and love between father and son.